Hey, thanks for watching this series of videos on EPA prep, specifically preparing for the EPA Section 608 exam, which is the exam that every HVACR technician needs to take and pass in order to legally handle refrigerant, whether that's recovery or charging. Anytime you're going to be taking refrigerant out of a tank and putting it in a system or taking it out of the system and putting it in a tank, you need to have your 608 license. And the 608 license, as we've talked about before, has four different parts and it breaks down into three different certifications. So you need to have core, and then you've got type one, which is small appliances, type two, which is high pressure appliances, but really it's it's most of the types of equipment that we work on. And then type three, which is your very low pressure appliances or systems. And that would be your chillers, specifically centrifugal chillers would be the most common application, but really anything that is a low pressure appliance. And when I, again, when I say appliance, I'm really just talking about a piece of equipment. So it doesn't mean a, a kitchen appliance. It means any sort of piece of equipment. So type three is our last part. It is the part that most technicians struggle with the most because it's the one that we use the least. Uh, there is a much smaller section of our industry that works on these low pressure types of appliances, specifically chillers. Historically, that would have been centrifugal chillers that operated on R11, more recently uh, R123, more recently HCFC uh, R123, which is sort of the R22 of large low pressure chillers. And then even more recently, we went to refrigerants uh, such as R514A and then r 1 one, two, three, three ZD is a modern refrigerant. So that would be an HFO, uh, which is sort of the next generation of replacement refrigerants. Uh, that's used in modern low pressure chillers. A lot of the same things are going to apply to type three that apply on core type one and type two. So make sure you follow those first. And like I've said in all of the videos, this is just sort of a quick refresher, just something to supplement um, your study. You need to be trained on it specifically by organizations that do this. Specifically, uh, ESCO is a really great source. Mainstream engineering, you can find out more also in RICS. And also I didn't mention this in the other ones, but the RACT manual, the Refrigeration and Air Conditioning Technology Manual has a really good section on this. So those are some really good study resources. I would also encourage you to take some practice exams, maybe use flashcards. There's a lot of good apps that allow you to practice uh, the exam as well, just so you get used to the sorts of questions that you're going to get. In many cases, they will not be the exact questions that are on the exam, but they'll often be in the same ballpark. And so it'll just help you prepare um, for the exam. <music>
part for systems where you're using recovery equipment that was manufactured before November 15th, 1993. You have to evacuate down to a 25 inch vacuum, 25 inches of mercury, or if it is manufactured after November 15th, 1993, which would be the mass vast majority of the equipment we work on, then you would need to evacuate down to either 28.9 inches or what they show generally on the charts is 25 millimeters of mercury absolute. And so I'm not going to go into the difference between those two pressure scales, but they are the same. So 28.9 inches of mercury column is the same as 25 millimeters of mercury absolute. You're kind of going in two different directions on those scales, but uh, both of those would be the correct answer for a system where the recovery machine was manufactured after November 15th, 1993. Another thing to know is that HCFC 123, which is a really commonly used refrigerant in these types of, uh, in this type of equipment, because it's a low pressure refrigerant, is a B1 refrigerant. So that's that from that ASHRAE chart where it talks about A refrigerants are non-toxic, B refrigerants are toxic. Because 123 is a B refrigerant, that means it is a toxic refrigerant, which means that you have to take some special care. You have to have alarms in any mechanical rooms to make sure that uh, you're monitoring four concentrations of our 123. You have to have mechanical ventilation in those rooms to make sure that if there is a leak that it can automatically be ventilated to the outdoors and then any rupture discs need to vent to the outdoors so they need to be piped outside so that if there is a rupture vent it's not venting all of that refrigerant inside the structure in addition to that there needs to be at least one self-contained breathing apparatus for maintenance staff if you know you need to get in and, and actually work on the equipment that now has a leak try to repair it you need to have um, self-contained breathing apparatus so you can get in and do so available to you again like any other large piece of equipment if you have more than 50 pounds you need to keep a log of all refrigerant that's being charged into that system so that that way you can ensure that you're not exceeding the allowable leak rate. So again, the same rules apply depending on the particular purpose of the low pressure system that would dictate what the allowable leak rates are in a given year. And you have to keep a log book in order to ensure that those rules are being complied with and you're bringing the leak rate down below the acceptable limit. When you are pressure testing a low pressure device, do not use a test pressure over 10 PSI. And I know that seems crazy because we are used to, uh, you know, pressurizing to much higher than that, but you, you can risk uh, blowing the rupture disc on the low side if you pressurize above 10 PSI. So that's the standard test pressure. When you are charging a low pressure refrigerant, especially when you have a chiller barrel where water is present, you want to bring the pressure up to above 32 degrees saturation by charging with vapor. So remember this, charge with vapor until you get above the freeze point of the refrigerant before you start adding liquid because you don't want to add liquid in below that so that it would potentially freeze the water in the chiller barrel and possibly cause damage to the chiller. When you're recovering, recover liquid first. By recovering liquid first, you are kind of doing the inverse. You're preventing that boiling process from occurring, which can result in uh, freezing and damage to the chiller. So when you are recovering refrigerant, recover liquid first. Another thing that's a good practice is to heat the oil. So that way that helps that oil release refrigerant as you're recovering. That's a good practice in all of the different segments, especially in low pressure equipment. It's a little more challenging to get the refrigerant out because you don't have a, this much pressure differential. And so any uh, heat that you can use, again, do it safely. I mean, you're not just taking a torch and putting it on things, but using heat in order to drive the refrigerant out of the oil can definitely help the process. Also chilling tanks, chilling your recovery tank, as we talked about last time, that's another way to help get refrigerant out of the system and into a tank. The term used for the pressure test of chiller tubes is called a hydrostatic tube test. And so when you're doing a leak check on chiller tubes, you use a hydrostatic tube test to do that. The reason why you have to pull a low pressure appliance down well below atmospheric pressure when you're doing a full recovery, a major repair as the EPA uh, dictates, if you had a heat exchanger replacement, uh, you're replacing a compressor or you're replacing a you know, condenser evaporator, anything, anything that's large, you have to pull it down below atmospheric is because a 350 ton R123 chiller at atmospheric pressure can still hold, easily hold 100 pounds of refrigerant. So that comes up a lot. The EPA talks about that um, as a standard. So the idea that pulling things down to atmospheric has all of the refrigerant out is certainly not true of any system, but it's definitely not true when you're dealing with a low pressure appliance that the evaporator is constantly running under atmospheric pressure. So when the refrigerant in the system is operating at near atmospheric pressure and on the low side below and on the high side, only slightly above, it stands to reason 
that you have to pull it down well below atmospheric pressure in order to get that refrigerant out. And that's where those standards come from. But just keep in mind, when you're doing a minor repair, you can still pull to atmospheric pressure. And that's when you're only going to have a small section open. Say you're replacing, you know, maybe a pressure switch or a transducer or something very small. Uh, in those cases, you don't need to pull down to that lower level. But in certain circumstances, you may actually have a pressure that's below atmospheric pressure standing. And so sometimes in order to get the pressure up, because you don't want to open the system and have air rush in, and you don't want to have refrigerant come out, you sometimes may need to actually warm the refrigerant in order to get it up to zero PSI. And in those cases, you can use heating blankets, sometimes even heated water from the heating system you can use in order to get that pressure to zero. In fact, that's a practice that's used for leak detection is you can uh, actually warm up the system uh, when it's off in order to drive those pressures up in order to perform electronic leak check to get it up to that point where you can adequately use a typical electronic leak detector to find leaks. That is one method that's used. And so again, use your heat wisely. Again, never overheat. You don't want to potentially, you know, blow a rupture disc, but just enough to get it up so that you can measure a leak so that the refrigerant is moving out of the system versus air moving into the system. ASHRAE standard 15-2013 is the standard that talks about refrigerant leakage safety within a structure for all refrigerant types. So everything that relates to, um, you know, again, is, is there going to be a leak that's so great that it could potentially displace oxygen? Or is it a toxic gas that could potentially be a, a toxicity issue, a B refrigerant? Or is it flammable? And now that's a concern. So all of those standards can be found at ASHRAE standard 15-2013 and specifically applies to these sorts of appliances because uh, you have R123, which is, you know, a toxic refrigerant, very common, and also the fact that they hold so much refrigerant. And final little tip is that in cases where you have a sight glass, a refrigerant sight glass that is uh, frosted up, I forgot to mention this on some of the others, but in order to clear up that sight glass, you can use a spritz of isopropyl alcohol. Don't use use a torch or something else silly like that. Use a spritz of isopropyl alcohol and then wipe it off and then you can see into the sight glass. So that's it. That is low pressure refrigerants. Again, certainly not the whole story. Read your study guide, do your practice exams, and uh, hopefully you'll be prepared to be a universally certified technician, which is a technician that has core. You've passed core and then type one, type two, type three. It's a nice resume item. Some people may say, why would I want to pass type three? I may never work on this type of equipment. And that may be true, but it's a nice resume item. And then you just don't have to worry about it anymore once you're universal certified. So hopefully you found this helpful. As always, you can find out more by going to hvacrschool.com. But again, follow up with those organizations that give the exam, such as ESCO and Mainstream Engineering. Thanks so much for watching. We'll catch you on the next video.